I'm going to talk about the decoy in the next talk, but this talk is um, about how we know that depredation is increasing in the Gulf of Alaska. And it's a study by Zach Zachner using some data from NOAA. And it documents the spread of this foraging behavior throughout the Gulf of Alaska. And what he did, he did something really unique. He took um, theory, used how agriculture spread in Europe a long, long time, hundreds of years ago, and applied that to this sperm whale population. It's one of the first times that type of theoretical um, analysis has been applied to a marine species. And so this is that wonderful video, snapshot of our whale grabbing the long line. So, and this is presented in this published paper that um, Zach published a few years ago. It's really a nice little um, 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 analysis that he did. And this is, a, this is a talk I gave in Dunedin in the Marine Mammal Conference a couple years ago. So the U.S. Sable Fish Survey, Federal Survey, both Megan and Jeff talked about it today. They use these two boats alternately, and they record the behavior of the sperm whales the same time of year, same stations every single year. It's a wonderful data set. They don't do anything different except change their boats every other year. It's really great, as, um, as Megan will, I think, tell us about. It's really a nice, nice, they don't, Alaska, I don't know if other fishermen are like this, but everybody does things different. No one fisherman does anything the same as another fisherman. They use different hooks. I just can't even go into how many differences there can be in one fishery. So, um, and they're very independent. And also when you plan on something, it never happens ever the way you want it to go. So um, that's another just a little nuance in working with fishermen. It's just this whole variability thing, which um, I've kind of gotten used to over time. So, so human and wildlife conflicts happen across the globe, everywhere. You know, um, bears, human conflict with garbage cans. The, uh, I think these are gorillas over here, and uh, I think those are sea lions and seals over on the uh, far right. You know, there's conflicts that happen throughout the world with interaction with human activities. We, we right now are having issues with humpback whales feeding on hatchery fry and smolts that. In Alaska, they do kind of a salmon ranch, and it's not fish farming. They raise little fry to be smolts and fry, and then they release them into salt water. And the humpback whales have figured out when those releases happen, and they're there waiting to eat them. So, so there's those type of act. And I don't think that's going to go away. I think we're going to see more and more as these whales recover from historical um, exploitation from a commercial whaling, we're going to be having more of these conflicts. And so I think it's just something we all need to think about and how we all can live in this ocean, this planet together. So. Um, so fishing and farming, and so sperm whales and killer whales, depredation of long line falls into this categories. Um, and what Zach did was he took the data from all the stations that Megan talked about and Jeff talked about, and he put them into a model of social transmission to see if it's an independent um, transmission of behavior, so actually it is spreading, and just to use these two theories uh, this, uh, um, to apply to this data to come up with a, a reasonable explanation of, of what's happening with the data that was collected over from, I think, 95 to 2014. So are individuals learning it just independently or are they learning from each other? And so this diffusion curve analysis is used usually to describe the innovation and transmission of human technology. So it's like Facebook. How did Facebook spread? Or um, what's that other one before Facebook? MySpace? So how did those types of social transmissions of, of those uh, tools that humans were using, how did it, how did it, where did it start? Where is the innovation point? And then how did it spread throughout the, the world? Um, so it's, what it does in a snapshot, it, it tells us how social learning things from, from other people and, and there's a model that, that you can apply data to and it'll, it'll tell you exactly whether it's happening or not. So. And you have to be able to reproduce it. So. And there's also this wave of, of advanced model. And you can track through time and you, again you find the locus of innovation and it's spatially radiated and that's how agriculture was, um, it was applied to agriculture. And otherwise things would just pop up randomly wherever they happen. And, and you can apply these models and really look at there is a pattern to how agriculture occurred in Europe and how it transmitted, radiated over time. Um, 
and you get this linear model if it is happening that way. So what Zach did, he took the data, he put it into the diffusion curve analysis, and these are really good used together. And this is a really innovative, um, and he, it took him a while to get it published because it was a really innovative use of the models for this data. But he finally got it published, and I think it's a really and nice, going to, and it's probably even spread more since um, Zach's data set ended. Um, basically, fishermen and, say, and the sperm whales like to be in the same place at the same time on the shelf edge. And, um, the good news with this is that the, um, our sperm whales go down to Canada, so we get to share that um, our, our sperm whales with the Canadians. But they use pots primarily, so it's not all that good news for our fishermen. Um, and the diffusion curve analysis, basically this model, his data fit this perfectly. The whales at each station range from one to seven, and this linear model, that linear line model right there fit perfectly and it was um, the best fit of the um, the, AI, the Aki Aki um, statistical analysis that you use to judge what, what model is the best fit to your data. Um, he then drew these maps which really shows how it spread over time. So those are all the stations and that's essentially where it started in that range. That's where the first data that was um, obtained in the mid-90s showed where depredation occurred. And as time went on, so from 99 to 2004, it spread north and south. So you can see how it went from a little tiny spot to north and south. And now it's, it's the sperm whale are working its way over towards past Kodiak, as you saw in some of Megan's maps. And so it's we don't know how far it's going to go, but um, it'll be interesting to see if those sperm whales in the Bering Sea that are primarily squid eaters historically do start feeding on off the, the long line gear. So. so, and that's how his linear model fit, the data fit the linear model. So, and again, that's, it's just in summary how it um, all lays out. So, started in the northern to the central gulf, went north and south, and now it's, it's actually occurring off the coast of Washington. Um, they have a very small long line fleet. They have 12 vessels that fish off the Quinault Indian Reservation. It's not a very big, big um, fleet, but they um, basically are telling us our whales are down there taking their fish off their long line gear. So. Um, and I said Canada has some problems, but not a lot. Our whales do go join up with the, our whales that we satellite tag do go join up with the um, Canadian whales and they feed it in the inside waters again um, on the inside of Haida Gwaii or just south of Dixon entrance. So what Zach found out was that both models did provide evidence for social transmission. Um, we couldn't find the locus of innovation where it started because the data wasn't collected early enough. So if you're going to do something like this, like Paul, I think you're looking at this for a student, you have to go way back in time and really, and hopefully you'll, you might have a really phenomenal data set to, to do this for. You could actually find out where that locus occurred. Um, and there's, there are learning mechanisms, the other things that the whales are doing. Um, but the good news for us, us is that it's males doing this and the transfer of knowledge from male to male is much slower than if it was a female. In typical mammalian, um, I think, uh, biology, females and their offspring are it's a much faster learning curve than it is for males to males. So that's one good news, except for the killer whales with the moms and calves. That's going to be just a nightmare. So, And, um, and it's interesting that that one killer whale was a male that, that was thought to be transferring, I think in Marta's data, transferring the, the information. Because that's really unusual for males to be the transfers of that type of information to a lot of other, to be the primary source. So I think that's um, it, very interesting. And uh, so in conclusion, this uh, novel foraging behavior is tra being transmitted from whale to whale. And um, we'll just see where it goes. It's, um, it's an interesting way to look at the data. and. And it's not going to really inform how we change our management, I don't think, of sperm whales in Alaska or management of the, the fishery. But it does tell us that I think the Bering Sea fishermen are going to be, I think we should be on alert for what's happening there. And the good news is that they're, they're surveying that area. Every, the Bering Sea is surveyed every other year. It trades off with the Aleutians. So um, we won't get every year data from both those areas, but at least we'll have something over time. So and I think that's all I have with this. And thank you.